Cool. Let's uh, let's start. Thanks again, guys. Um, my name is uh, Vlad Delushenko. I'm a CTO and co-founder of uh, QuestDB. Um, and uh, I'm just like you, I'm a software developer, really. And today we are going to uh, talk about um, database hacking and uh, more specifically, trying to build fast bulk import uh, procedure for a database in Java. And um, this is going to be a story of how we built it and hopefully um, you, you'll find it um, useful in some ways. Right, uh, what is uh, QuestDB? Um, QuestDB is a, is a time series database. Um, it's um, uh, the emphasis on performance and uh, ease of use via SQL. It's built entirely uh, in Java, when I say entirely, um, we use heavily uh, GNI uh, of heap memory and uh, some of the um, code implementations is actually in C. And the reason for that is that we want to use uh, CPU specific instruction sets for, for faster data processing. Right, um, what is a uh, time series exactly? Um, I know, uh, to my surprise, uh, uh, this, this question was uh, quite profound when I spoke to a lot of you today. Um, so the uh, Wikipedia definition of time series is, uh, is data, um, whatever you do with it, you present it, analyze it, process it in, uh, in time order. And uh, uh, typically time series is, uh, is a data that's obtained from uh, automated data sources um, that, that move in time. Um, this could be uh, uh, application metrics, could be um, um, industrial sensors, could be um, markets like currency markets uh, and um, equity markets and stuff like that. And um, time series workflows are typically ingestion heavy because the data is, uh, is coming uh, uh, via automated sources that don't really care how fast you're ingesting. And um, because of the volume, um, the data can be problematic for, for queries. So that's a bit of a backstory. I used to, uh, I used to work for a big company uh, that deals with time series data. And um, I, I wanted to use closed source database. Um, it was quite expensive, but um, yeah, that, that didn't, didn't fly with my boss at all. And uh, that, was <laughs> that was because he spent uh, big bucks on an uh, XML database at the time, and uh, he wanted me to use it for, for time series use cases. So I was, uh, I was really not having it. And um, uh, soon after, a few years after, EquestDB was born as a project. All right, so because EquestDB is a database and just like like any database you can imagine, um, it has to have some way of, uh, of importing initial data sets besides of dealing with uh, automated sources. And uh, um, we, want to have, uh, want to have, we wanted to have users to have the best experience possible while loading, loading massive data files. Uh, and those data files I'm talking about are CSVs for, for now. And um, we kind of need to bear in mind because it's a, it's a time series again use case, the files are typically massive uh, compared to, uh, for example, you have a, a box with, I don't know, 16 gigabyte of RAM and the person is trying to uh, um, upload the data, which is like 500 gig on this box. Um, and uh, the, the handicap to that is uh, QuestDB stores data ordered by time. So whenever somebody uploads a massive file, we have to put it in, in time order in order to allow queries uh, fast execution time. So we, um, we already had this kind of a while ago, we built um, a data import, which is a, a HTTP based upload. So you can, see, uh, you can see here, you can curl data in like quite, quite easily and it doesn't require server access. Um, it would, there's a heuristic there that would try and understand the structure of the file and insofar as column names and, and types and stuff like that. And it would, uh, would upload it relatively okay. Until, until that time, the files became really big. Um, and the, the disadvantages of this approach, um, it's a single threaded upload, which doesn't saturate the, uh, the network at all. Um, and somebody had to sort this data and it typically fell on, uh, on the user's shoulders, which 
if if I were to ask you to try and sort 500 gig CSV file, it's it's not easy easy thing to do. And uh, internally, we partition data as well. And this this import procedure didn't really I didn't care about partitioning. So um, in practice, um, user experience was super clunky. So data had to be sorted, and that was the bigger, biggest, um, biggest problem for everybody. Um, we did provide some of the sorting capabilities, but they, they are uh, RAM-based sorting. So again, if you take a big file, um, if you're trying to sort it in RAM, this process usually doesn't even fail fast. It just chugs along, it takes forever to finish, and usually people just give up and, and go home and, and pick another database, actually. That's, that's what they did, you know. And uh, now we kind of sat down and, and uh, to think, look, uh, what can we do to um, to go from this sort of disaster to uh, to some sort of success and give users decent experience? Um, well, the first thing that came, uh, well, we had to do is to take over the uh, sorting, the input. So we had to basically say, okay, you, you can upload or give us a file that is not sorted and we'll deal with it. Um, and the way we deal with it also um, must not have been, well, must not be memory bound because we're just back to the same problem where there's not enough memory to sort the massive file. And uh, with all of these constraints, we just had to make it really fast, really, really fast. The fastest we can, we can do, as we do with everything we try to do. Um, so before, before we began, we, we kind of, again, we had to sort of acknowledge Few few things that we, we you have to do um, is that first is we try and make uh, use of uh, of available CPU to uh, to effectively use multiple threads for whatever we do as as much as we can um, and the sorting of the file would have to be done um, uh, via multiple passes of the file. There's there's no way we can sort the file on the fly sort of uh, through one pass. And sorting algorithms as well, they, they all um, uh, sort of, they all boil down to random access to data. So there's, there's um, no way to, to get around it. And, um, and in, this, in this talk, we kind of, uh, I'll show you how we kind of thought about this and also how we tested it, right? So, and uh, to test it, uh, just to, to stay on the same side, we, we used um, 76 gigabyte um, um, randomly sorted CSV file, and we used quite typical uh, AWS boxes that would not be expensive to 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 rent on on Amazon. So, um, so our new bulk import procedure would would look like this. So that there will be a copy command, right? Uh, you might be familiar with this concept with the Postgres or or other other databases. So. In this instance, the uh, the file would have to be local to the database. Well, it does have its own sort of pros and cons. The pro for, for our particular method is that we can pass this local file multiple times. It's just sitting on a disk and we can do as many passes as we want. Um, but the, the, the con, obviously, the, the, the file has to has to get to the database server somehow. But we, we leave it to to the end. So and our copy example would look like um, uh, copy then table name from a file, uh, and then then there's the keywords to say with timestamp to to say where where timestamp is in the file, which field is it, uh, the format of the timestamp and how the table need to be partitioned and partitioning does depend on uh, uh, on on data distribution. So the plan right so. The plan, I'll go through it in, in detail, is to, to do it in three, broadly, three phases. Um, the first phase is, uh, well, the, the idea behind this phase, what we want to do, we want to split the file into, uh, into chunks so that uh, further processing can be, can be done parallel. Um, with regards to disk access, uh, this, this phase is totally sequential, and um, the difficulty in this phase, where this phase exists, actually, is when you split the file um, one on size, you might find that you split uh, a line or you might split um, file value somewhere between the quotes, for example, right? 
Um, so this this check is uh, is is effectively uh, counting uh, quotes and line ends and and through uh, even and odd numbers works out which which chunks have to be adjusted to uh, to to encapsulate the entire line. And we're going to benchmark this phase as well uh, on uh, and this typically on on throughput of a disk. This is this is a sequential disk access. Uh, phase two. Um, is indexing. So this phase is also gonna, gonna do another pass of a data file and uh, it will try and um, parse the timestamp in the data file and it will create uh, an index. Um, this index is uh, nothing else than um, uh, it's, for all intents and purposes, is a 128-bit value, uh, sort of 64-bit one, one part is the offset, epoch offset, which timestamp value, and the other 64-bit is a row number where that timestamp is, right? So this phase also uses a, a radix uh, sort to, to get the maximum sort efficiency from, uh, from, from this 128-bit 20, value. And uh, but this, this phase is also going to be bottleneck on disk throughput. Uh, because it's, it uses sequential, although multi-threaded now, uh, it's, uh, it's going to use sequential disk access. And uh, the phase three is the, the fun phase, as they call it. Um, this phase does the, um, the actual ordering. So uh, we'll focus on this phase later on, um, but it just uses reads index and tries to then uh, find the lines randomly in the file and then put them in the table where it needs to go. So obviously after we fixed all of, well, just put this all together, we had to, uh, had to benchmark this and just see if, if this approach kind of makes sense at all. I mean, if it improves user experience. Um, then we want basically, as I, as I said uh, earlier, the, uh, we wanted to perform on very inexpensive boxes. So we don't really want to have massive box uh, with big amount of RAM to deal with the problem. Um, we also want to uh, uh, see how we exercise the disk in this case. Um, so the file that we pick is, uh, is larger than RAM by, by a long margin. And um, Obviously, we want CSV to be the worst kind in terms of how random it is. Uh, and uh, one of our competitors actually, probably on purpose, um, delivered a very good file for us. Uh, it's just uh, 76 gig, really pure evil. It's just that not a single line is together, kind of, so everything is totally random. Um, right, so off to benchmarking. I'm going to have to explain this table a little bit um, in case uh, you guys are unfamiliar with um, AWS, right? So uh, we benchmarked on two boxes. Um, this uh, C6 ID box is uh, just largely eight, eight CPU, 16 gig of RAM. Uh, the D in, well, I stands for Intel CPU and D stands for, uh, it's got NVMe disk attached to it for, for ease of testing. And the other box is, um, it's slightly larger. It's like next one up um, from from the first one, and just for for kicks, we um, we also benchmarked it on, on really fast disk. That that disk, uh, the last one, uh, I think it's Corsair disk of some kind. So it's a PCI Express uh, uh, four NVMe disk. It's quite recent. Um, so here's our result. Oh yeah. Okay. So before we go there, there's uh, three types of vol volumes on AWS, and uh, the First one is called IO1, and uh, the third one, GP3. Those um, uh, drives provided by AWS infrastructure, for all intents and purposes, those are network disks. Uh, they, they just implemented like uh, block devices, uh, so the operating system sees them as an NVMe drive, in air quotes. And you can format them extended for and, and such like. Um, the difference between them is, um, IO1 is supposed to be IO optimized, and uh, it's about 100 times more expensive than GP3. It's, it's just crazy how expensive it is. Um, but what we saw here is that, well, on, on throughput, IO1 kind of they didn't even edge uh, GP3 for some reason. So 
what we see here is particular that state phase one and phase two, phase two and throughput, they um, they are not too bad. They're not too far from from the disks. Oops, computer fell asleep. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, they're not too far from what disks uh, can can do. So GP3 disk, you can you can pick configurations of this. This one is uh, configured for one gig throughput and 16K IOPS, uh, that particular one. And uh, it delivered on uh, on eight threads, and as you can see on 16 threads, it didn't go any further, like it's the same thing. So you can, you can saturate uh, the throughput with eight threads quite easily, and perhaps with less, but it's, it's, it's good to test this. Whereas uh, NVMe uh, looks like, um, yeah, it looks like it improved, but that is a bit misleading, actually. Uh, it didn't improve. So what happens here is um, when you pick a smaller box, AWS gives you um, a smaller, I think it's 400 or 800 gigabyte disk. And with a larger disk, they give you a different NVMe. It's a different, different device. Actually, um, with number of threads, even NVMe doesn't improve. So. If I were to run, uh, and I did, if I were to run eight threads uh, import on uh, 16 core CPU, it would show exactly the same result as 16 cores. So it basically, there's no improvement there whatsoever. And um, on, the, on the right side, where the disk is really fast, we can see where those stages actually bottleneck. So the first one, because it's very simple, splitting the file doesn't bottleneck at all. It just went through six and a half, six and a half gigabyte a second. The second one, because it, it produces index, it, it caps out at uh, 3.3 gigabytes. It doesn't quite reach the disk throughput, but it's sort of, it's quite, quite high, um, uh, high, high level. But our phase three where we're sorting and our random access situation, um, yeah, it doesn't look great. It basically looks really bad. So on, on a disk that can uh, uh, can put through, sorry, oops, yeah, on a disk that can put through um, 600 megabytes a second, the random access phase did 23 megabytes a second. It's it's just it's really bad. It's really really slow, um, and it didn't do much better on a faster disk. So it's 300 or 400 megabytes a second on a disk capable of six and a half gig is, is also quite low. So, um, so what's going on? I mean, like we, we, this is was our, was our actual dilemma when we did this first time, benchmarked it, then looking at numbers, saying, "Oh my God!" You know. So this is phase three pseudocode. This is what it does broadly. So it does read an index, and it reads index sequentially. Um, then from index, it uh, it reads the file and it picks offset from an index and the, and the length of a string, right? And then uh, it goes to CSV parser and parses the file. This is a write, write a callback is, is the code uh, that would write out the actual values to the database. So there's not much here to, to go wrong. So we thought, okay, so this read is a, is a GNI call. It's one of them, right? And we're thinking, well, maybe it's GNI that is slow, right? So, um, and this is GNI bench, GNI benchmark. So we're calling um, we're calling a no op GNI method that doesn't do anything; just returns a constant constant zero. And uh, the baseline uh, here in the test um, is there to uh, to time the actual GMH test execution. The baseline doesn't do anything at all; doesn't call anything. This is the cost to to execute GMH test. And uh, here we can we can tell that there's about seven nanosecond per. GNI call. Um, so it's not bad. Um, so the file uh, is roughly 100 million rows in it. So if you multiply seven by 100 million, so you end up with roughly 0.7 of a second, which is not it's not it's not a big deal for for something that takes minutes, you know. So um, yeah. So maybe it was a CSV parser, right? Um, so parser wasn't new, um, and m we must have became become really complacent with the parser. Thought, okay, so how bad can it be? 
and uh, we compared it to the rest of the field and um, it wasn't bad, but you know, not great. So it could be faster. So what did we do here? So this is very simple optimization. Uh, it's Java, uh, Java kind of related optimization. We call it like hot pass optimization. So if you look on the right side, um, right, right side of the screen, the line 198, so this line is executed 99.9% um, .9 of the time. It's basically for every character, it just goes in this line. It doesn't, uh, the CPU doesn't go in those ifs or anything, it just ends up in uh, incrementing the value. And um, well, the point of this optimization is, okay, uh, let's refactor the code in such a way that we check the condition, all conditions, where we need to increment this field, right? And then if those conditions are not met, we're just going to call our old method slow and uh, just leave it at that, right? Um, right, and this was one of the methods that we optimized. This is called on, on every character. There's another method optimized in the same way. That method is called on every field in there. And, and this file actually is, is really, really bad. It's like 100 fields and stuff, some just crazy, crazy things. Um, and, uh, wow, it gave us... Just this, there's nothing else. Gave us a minute improvement on the CSV file consistently. And uh, uh, I would also add, um, somehow, uh, which I cannot explain, um, our code uh, doubles in performance on Apple M1 CPU, whereas other parsers do not. So for some reason, on Apple um, M1 CPU, it would take two minutes, 30 seconds to do the same file, actually on this very computer. And uh, that, that was done on, uh, on a Threadripper CPU uh, and the NVMe disk, you know? So the disk is not a bottleneck here, so you should, should do it. So on disk, just to, um, to convert this thing into uh, megabytes a second, this four minutes equates to roughly 350 megabytes a second parsing speed. Whereas if I were to comment out the parse uh, line, uh, the execution speed of the loop would be 1.3 gigabyte a second without parsing. So the parsing is definitely the the bottleneck in the, in the reading. So not not the disk. So yeah, moving on. So parsing sorted. Now we're looking at um, flame graph from async profiler. Um, so you guys, well, if you don't use it already, I would strongly recommend you look at it. It's, it's really, really, really cool piece of technology. So what we're looking at is our read, actual P read, it says it takes 70% of the time. It's basically, we, we spend in this, in this call 70% of the time, sort of throughout the whole phase three. Um, right, so what is that P read? Um, right, so P read is a, is a Linux call. Um, it's not something we invented at all, so we virtually call this p-read from via GNI. So latency to call this is 7 nanos, we measured it. Um, there's nothing we can do to improve the performance of this method because it's a Linux call. Um, and uh, then wondering what, what can we do? Is there, is there like another way to read, random read file? Um, okay, and then um, we came across uh, a utility called uh, FIO. Um, it's just a Linux utility. Uh, 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 well, I hope you're aware of this. If, if not, it's really useful to benchmark disk speed. So, and this is the, the below, there's a command line that um, we used. So, um, what this command does, it, it reads the same file, uh, it says file name hit CSV. Uh, it, it does the random read. Um, it uses block size for kilobytes. Um, num jobs is number of CPUs it's going to use. We'll get to that later. And that uses IO engine called IO Uring, right? Um, direct means uh, it bypasses um, OS disk cache, so it just goes to disk right away. Uh, it's it's useful just to understand the disk performance that's not sort of diluted by cache. And um, IO depth is something to do with, well, I'll, I'll uh, address that later, is to do with uh, IO uring configuration parameter. 
and uh, the rest of it is just the output and how long it runs. And, uh, and we see that sort of using just read, although on, in our case, we do both read, parse, and write, there's more to do, but, but in theory, these disks uh, on random read are capable of, of these numbers. Um, and again, as you notice, the same disks, IO1, GP3, it's exact same disk and VME. And again, this is uh, it's quite fascinating information here. Um, the performance is the same with, with number of CPUs. You add CPUs, performance doesn't change. It's the same thing. In fact, it's not, it's not, it's not a slide for it, but even if you run it with one CPU, your num jobs is gonna be one. The performance figures are gonna be the same. So I guess the uh, conclusion from these numbers is that um, the random access to disk and perhaps somewhere else is probably the worst uh, the worst part of the worst bit that you can, the slowest bit that you can you can exercise. So, um, and our phase here, our phase three is no, nowhere near reaching these numbers at all. So it's it's far far down. So what do we do? Um, we thought, well, can we? we uh, I would just remind here that we we are. Uh, we're using Java here. So most of most of this import is Java outside of uh, calling read functions and opening files through JJ and I calls. Um, so we implement IO Uring, right? So, um, okay, so on the right, the code, this is roughly how the code looks like, kind of uh, reading disk via IO Uring, that's, that's on the right. So um, IOU Ring is a, is a subsystem that's um, provided by kernel. Um, it's not available in all kernel versions, so the version of the kernel need to be checked before using it. So there has to be a fallback mechanism is, if it's not available. Um, this subsystem is um, is queue based. So to read something, right? So you submit a request to your queue. Um, and then, uh, then you can submit many things at once, and then you call ring submit. That that actually tells it tells the subsystem to do stuff. And then you read from um, completion queue whenever whenever you're ready to read. Um, so, and this is this is the code kind of roughly that does it. So the first part submits read requests. The sec well, the middle part does submit, and then then we read read back from a queue. So, what are the? I mean, there's more code here than just doing p read and or read. Um, how come this might improve performance, right? And uh, improve can improve performance in in two ways. Um, one, uh, the requests to 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 read to submit something to the queue are actual memory writes versus system calls. And system calls are expensive to, to make. They, they, they've got locks, mutexes, and whatever, whatever else in them. So we just replace system call with a memory write. And the second thing is, as we start reading the completion queue, our requests in the queue are still executing. So it gives us a level of parallelism as we parse the text the OS is still reading the buffers that remain in the queue. And as, as we parse the line, oh my God. Um, as we parse the line, um, the next buffer is ready. So we do it asynchronously to a degree. And, and this is, this is uh, well, uh, I didn't say QuestDB is, is, is published uh, to Maven Central as a library. So you can just include an independency in theory. You can use that in your application, like right now. You know, you can you can write an application that uses this. The only caveat here that we have to deal with, and the actual code is more complex, is that a UU ring is um, might reorder your requests. So, for example, you submit basically uh, ten. You need to submit like ten lines in the queue. You submit like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? And from here, you might read, I don't know, line number eight before line number two. Th th that's a bit of a bummer uh, because we're relying on our submission code uh, does things in, in, oops, sorry, in the order 
uh, that, that we need to write it to disk, and then when it comes out uh, reordered, it's a bit of a bummer. There's a code to deal with this. If it detects out of order, um, uh, out of order completion requests, it has to do something else. Just need to park them and basically process process. Um, well, anyway, there's there's more code to it, to put it simply. But um, the complete code it is in our our source control, so you, you can definitely have a look at how complete code works. And um, right, and this is this is the result just by replacing read with IOU ring. So. We are still um, we're still not massively close to um, read throughput of a disk, but look on IO one we just improved well, I don't know three times and a bit right, and uh, two two times on on NVMe and basically twice twice as fast on on the same random read we get exactly the same data out of the system compared to normal period, and. Uh, Ironically, the IOU ring system is not actually implemented in Java. So if you were to read this file randomly via Java libraries, you would get the same performance as PRead gives you pretty much. This is something to be to be aware of. It's it's really, really slow. So uh, and to put things in uh, uh, I guess in perspective as in why we do it in the first place. So this is the same file on a slightly, uh, slightly beefier machine, and uh, we can get it from, well, just get it in, in uh, what is that, five and, six, five and a half minutes, right? It's a little bit slower than uh, our kind of some of our competitors like ClickHouse, but um, they don't really time the sorting of the file. They just do it in, in one pass, and uh, that's, that's what they time. And it's a lot faster than uh, than any any other database can do. Even though um, our sort of sorting mechanism does not read, does not reach the throughput of a disk. And uh, I guess conclusions, right? So this was um, really the steps uh, we had to go through while while building this import, and we kind of learned quite a bit. Um, specifically, we learned a lot about IOPS, right? So disks come with, uh, I guess when you get a disk, they, it comes with a throughput that most of us uh, pay attention to, like it's a good throughput, six gig a second, but also this come with IOPS limits. And these IOPS limits, they, um, they say up a bound for, for random access. This is what is gonna limit random access to disk. Um, and uh, I guess if you can avoid random access to disk, you should because it's 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 really slow. Um, most cloud drives um, are IOPS limited, so even though they they show great throughput on on sequential reads and whatnot, the IOPS are low. And as soon as you start re re random reading the uh, Amazon drive. You're gonna see it, and the drive that we used is not—it's uh, not a low-performance drive. It's relatively high-performance GP3 drive with 16k IOPS, which is, I think, it's the max you can put on GP3 drive. So IO1 uh, technically has 40k IOPS. It's a higher, um, higher IOPS machine. Um, so, but all of them are limited compared to SSD. It's just something to be aware of if you work with disk. And um, I guess our bulk import journey is, uh, well, has to continue. We need to figure out why we're not reaching um, disk speeds, um, perhaps improve our writes. And also, we, we kind of need to build workflow to avoid this uh, um, need to upload the file to, uh, to your local drive. Yeah, I think, I think that's, uh, that's all I have. Um, that's, uh, if you guys have any, yes, any any questions, um, I'm happy to take them. Sure. Oh, there's there's a question. Wait, wait, wait. There's a question. <laughs> file is small enough to sort in memory. 
and you just sort each file in memory and concatenate, and then you have it sorted. I would have the feeling, maybe it's exactly what you do, I didn't understand it well, but okay. I would have the feeling that's an interesting approach. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So, yes, you can split the file and sort it separately. The issue with that is that uh, you're going to have to employ a merge sort afterwards because you have two sorted of data sets that, that might go like that, you know, when you put them together, they have, they, they, you need to splice them. And then... I want to do like the partition. So you have the key, like timestamp, mm -hmm. and you have a range of like two minutes or two seconds or whatever is reasonable, and you make sure that file A contains only elements that are smaller than file B, and file B only elements that are smaller than file C. That's and right, yeah. You don't need to merge sort the files because that is already done in the previous step. That, that's, that's, yeah, okay, I understand, sorry. So, but even to do that, uh, you, you have to run the maxes. Okay, okay. So, Okay, 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 I got it, sorry. So what this, what this does, it actually converts uh, random reads into random writes, yeah. right? So that, that's what it does, right? So uh, technically on, a, on, on the devices, like uh, SSD devices, random reads are perceivably slower than uh, random writes. Uh, when I, when I, why I say perceivably, because when you uh, read a, a random read a file, SSD could not fake anything. So it has to actually read the data and give it to you. When you write the file, SSD is use cache. So you write to SSD cache and SSD writes it later. That's why write speed a little bit higher than, than read speed. But ultimately it depends on how useful, useful or full the cache is. So with the, with the high enough throughput, you might get a little bit of a gain, but not not dramatically more. So that's that's the that's the difference. We did think about this. We do, we don't we don't randomize writes, so we kind of chose random reads versus random writes. It is an approach, but so that if if we look at stats that drives give you that it's a it's a very marginal gain. Random writes marginally faster than random reads. That's why it's going to be roughly the same. There's one more, yeah. The size of the ring oh, I'm sorry, yeah. The size of the ring we're using is 32 elements. 32, yeah. With, with this test, um, uh, we found that sizes below 32 in, in, in on this particular file, maybe a particular block size, uh, lead it, the performance is less, or slow, it, things become slower. Um, size is above 32, like 64. By the way, size needs to be power of two. So you, the, the way you go either 16 or 32, so there's no, no other choice. So uh, if you go to 32, performance is the same. It, it has n zero net effect on performance. Cool. Guys, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I know it's been uh, yeah, it's a difficult, difficult subject to tackle, but thank you for staying, staying awake, kind of. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.